been living on Sydney's northern beaches for about 15 years now. She's still very connected with the community and all the causes that she stands up for. I've been campaigning to have the shark nets moved from the beaches for a long time. They catch so few potentially dangerous animals. I'd like to welcome our first very special and very exciting guest, Valerie Taylor, to come and speak to you all today. We owe the marine world to stop this mesh killing. It's time they were pulled out. Valerie, it's such a pleasure to meet you. I've been a big fan. You've inspired generations of yes. conservationists and people advocating for sharks. I don't have much life left, I don't think, but I would like to see those nets out. If push comes to shove, I might go down there and start cutting an animal out and wait to be arrested. Nothing like television to get something done to let the people know. Anybody growing up in the 60s and 70s would know Valerie Taylor. We find that sharks attack more readily when we float on the surface. She was a pioneer of her time and um, she still is. Valerie was the lady in the pink wetsuit doing all these amazing things with sharks. Ron and Val's concern is not for themselves, but for the sharks. When they started to look at sharks differently, I think the influence in the Australian community was phenomenal. But this kind of courage has helped make her one of the world's champion women of the sea. He was a woman uh, doing what was supposedly only the domain of men. Was she less fearful than most? Uh, absolutely. I mean, standing on the edge of a cliff to me is sheer bravery. Jumping in amongst a bunch of sharks, good fun. Valerie, looking good. <laughs> I'm very old now, and I would love to have a quiet life, but really, there's so much to be done. We are killing the planet that supports us. I'm not a marine biologist. I'm not a scientist. I'm just a stupid old lady who happens to know. <laughs> I've been working with Valerie probably for about a year now. She's been a long-time supporter of the Australian Marine Conservation Society who I work for, and there's a couple of big issues, and one of them is the shark nets. So these nets, Valerie, just out past there, a few hundred metres off from shore. I don't know quite what to do. I just know what it's like to see beautiful animals struggling away. Some people argue that prior to shark nets, there were a lot more fatalities, but we're advocating for more modern day methods. I mean, we've got the technology, we've got drones, we can tag and track them, and we can make the beaches safer. But the main problem we're primarily working on is increasing the protections for critically endangered grey nurse shark on the east coast of Australia. The grey nurse shark has always had a special place in Valerie's heart. We know they've been on quite a sharp decline, and that's largely because of spear fishing and recreational fishing. And right now I'm working on having their habitats protected. But speaking from experience, I know that working on conservation of the marine world, it's a huge battle. Every success follows a dozen failures. As a conservationist, the most important thing I've learned from Valerie is don't give up. I was born in Crown Street Hospital, Sydney, 1935. The boys came later, which was good. I was the boss of everybody. I was the eldest. I moved to New Zealand with my parents when I was three and a half. There was a war on. My mother, and I'd say all the mothers in the street, they worked at home. They used to go out and grow vegetables. Valerie and my father had a childhood of poverty. They, they always had food on the table, but there was never any excess. 
but they always had the, the love of their parents, uh, which was a big thing. My mother realised that I wasn't ever going to be academic and she always encouraged me with my drawings and paintings. Well, I could paint, I was good at all the crafts and I was good at sport. Well, I was good at sport until I got polio. When Valerie was 12, uh, she was diagnosed with polio. That was obviously a big shock for the family. She went into hospital. She was in there for about three months. And there was really questions as to whether she was going to make it through and be all right. I couldn't walk. I couldn't sit up. I couldn't move my right arm or hand. And I was in constant pain. Deep in your bones, your bones just shrinking, your body shriveling, and the treatment was hot packs, very hot packs. They'd wrap you up in hot towels and then wrap you in a canvas and leave you there for a while. And then they'd unwrap you and they would start stretching you. And a doctor or a worker in the hospital would grab my leg and slowly pull it till I was screaming, then release it. And here I am. No calipers. When Valerie was in hospital, she started reading. And books like, you know, Tom Sawyer and um, Huckleberry Finn and all those old classics. And I had to wait for a nurse to come up long to turn a page. But my, I, I started training my left arm to creep up on the platform. Once it got up there, I could hang on. And with a bit of difficulty to turn the pages for myself. There's no doubt that those books changed my life. They were the books that told me I could have an adventure. By the time I got out of hospital, academically, I was far behind. When I turned 15, my mother said, uh, Valerie, you're 15 today, you leave school tomorrow, and you go out and get a job. My mother brought all her children up to believe they were beautiful, intelligent, clever, always admiring everything we did. And I thought, I could do anything I want. The world is mine. Valerie and the family moved back to Australia. And it wasn't long after that that she got a job with press features. And she was basically redrawing American cartoons to be published here in Australia. The guy in charge of Australia, Mr Menzies, would not import anything into Australia if it could be done here. They're all American comics. And uh, there was, well, you can see, Dippy the Duck, Foxy Fagan, Muggsy Mouse <laughs> and Lil Abner. We used the same commentary, but Australianised it. Took out the American slang. After Valerie's day job working at Press Features, she'd often work the nights modelling, where she'd pose for an art class. She just had a knack of seeing an opportunity even though Valerie had never had any formal acting training, she'd go off and audition for parts. I was 26 when I read for a part in a play called The Seven Year Itch, and I got the part. Valerie, how much acting had you done before you got this lead in The Seven Year Itch? Well, this is the first time I've been on the stage before I got this part. I hadn't even seen a play, actually. But these things don't just happen. But it does. Uh, well, it happened to me. And she just fell into it. It wasn't like this big career choice that she was making and was a bit of a natural on, on the stage. So you don't try to imitate Marilyn Monroe? No, well, I couldn't. I'm not the type. She's got a much bigger bust than I have and much bigger everything. It lasted for about six months and it could have kept going except that I wanted to do other things. I wanted something more adventurous. When my family moved back to Australia, we lived close to the ocean and uh, we taught ourselves to dive 
And one day, a guy called Bruno saw me spearing fish, and he said, we don't have any good women spearfishing. Would you join the club? So I joined the club, and that's where I met Ron. He was the best spearfisherman in the world, and he was beautiful, and he was gentle. And I saw this pretty blonde girl in the club, and uh, during an outing down at Watamala, I asked if she would swim in front of my camera for me, and she did. And uh, I thought, wow, she looks good. <laughs> that was really my introduction to getting to know marine animals really well. I would not have made such an impact on him if I hadn't have been willing to swim around and do things with marine animals. I think a lot of girls just paddle around to please their boyfriends. But Valerie is genuinely interested in the undersea life. I was slender and long, and I suppose I looked pretty good in those days. I'd frighten everybody today. <laughs> and then in 1960, Valerie and I were at the same film festival at Heron Island, underwater film festival. They had a competition for Miss Heron every year. And it wasn't just looking beautiful in a bathing costume. You had to do a series of underwater tricks. Well, that was no problem for me. I could hold my breath for a long time. <laughs> so I went to Miss Heron and won. And it was uh, where we actually became, uh, well, he came up, became my boyfriend. Ron always wanted to be a photographer and he hoped to be able to make a living as a cameraman. Ron was the very quiet, retiring guy who was a technical genius, built all of his own camera housings and equipment. Back in the early days, Ron, uh, being one of the only people filming underwater, uh, they could see the commercial potential for this. It was difficult at first. It, it wasn't instant success. Because when, when we first started, we had no reputation. But he found he could sell his 16 millimeter black and white film to Movie Town News for 25 pounds an item. That was huge. Movie Town's underwater cameraman, Ron Taylor, rolls our film and first up spots a couple of sand rays. So every weekend, Ron and I'd go out looking for action and it had to be something big, something dangerous. Sharks. We're on a shark hunt, and Valerie wastes no time getting on his tail. It was all then about shark the predator, shark the danger. And of course, sharks can be dangerous. When I first started snorkeling and diving, I was worried about sharks. It was drummed into you to be petrified of sharks. The shark alarm would go off on the beach and everybody would run, and it was shark, shark, you're going to be eaten alive if you don't get out of the water. In the 60s, there were several people killed in shark attacks in Sydney Harbour, in, you know, waist-deep water. And grey nurse sharks had a bad reputation. A grey nurse has this sort of tangled teeth, and so they, uh, the immediate thought was, they're the killer. But these shark attacks weren't grey nurse. Finally, to round off a good day's sport, we've got a grey nurse in our sight. A beautifully streamlined 10 to 12 feet of sudden death. One of the early films that uh, Ron made was called Revenge of a Shark Victim. We used a friend of ours who had been bitten by a shark. And with a 303 cartridge in his spear gun, revenge is sweet. We're not proud of it, because his revenge was killing Grey Nurse. And there it is. Hit in the spine, the Grey Nurse dies almost instantly. And that none too soon for us. You were a big hero if you went out and speared and killed a shark. You were saving thousands of lives by killing this monster. The films that they produced, they spent their time going around New South Wales and other parts, showing these to sort of little groups who would, you know, basically relish the idea that they're shooting these killers. Up collected a lot of stuff over the years, drawers of it, shelves of it, and uh, here's some posters. They're very old. We'd hire a barn or a hall or something, 
and for a few shillings, the general public could come in and see this. We'd stick these posters up. And it paid for our petrol, our camping fees, and our food. By now, I'm going out with Ron, basically spearfishing, or to be on camera. But when I first met Ron, I had a boyfriend. Gary was a guitarist and a singer. And one day I said, Ron, I said, if you don't want to marry me, I'll marry Gary, because he's asked me. And Ron said, let's get married now. <laughs> you can see his on-camera actress vanishing with a singer. And that sort of scared him a little bit. We just went to the registry office and got married. We had very little money. The only person who had anything at all was me, because Ron had spent everything he ever earned on camera equipment. But we found a fibre box, really, at the edge of the industrial area, under the flight path at Mortdale. Listen, first off, I think we'll do the uh, fish feeding sequences. Ron was an exceptional human being, in my mind. Very clever, very gentle. We'll keep our eye open for that manta ray, because if he swims around, we'll uh, we want to take advantage. If I'd done a good job, he'd pat me on the knee. He'd say, that was good, Valerie. That's big time loving from Ron. Ron was an old fashioned man and a woman had her place and a man had his. I don't think he could even boil an egg, though he could make toast. I think that's how marriages were once. We each filled a niche and it worked. We started selling to television, and that was a big thing. Growing up, I remember being at home on a Sunday night with my parents, watching wildlife documentaries on TV. It was the thing we all did then. And Ron and Val Taylor would pop up frequently. We'd never seen anything like it before. Off the northeast coast of Australia, billions of tiny coral polyps have created one of nature's awesome engineering feats. Our early films, were a little bit like science fiction. We were in an alien environment about which the human race knew very little. The abundance of life on the Barrier Reef was extraordinary. I'm lucky. I've seen things that don't exist anymore. You know, they brought the underwater world into the home, both through photography and their movies. The two of them together were just an amazing unit. Both of them were like dolphins in the water. I fly when I'm underwater. I can see something way over there and fly across to it. It's wonderful. You know, I pass a turtle. And if I swim exactly like it does, I can swim with it as close as I want. Eels, you can befriend an eel so quickly. She had a great relationship with moray eels. You know, she'd go up and tickle them under the chin. Massive moray eels with teeth on them that had been known for, you know, taking people's fingers off. And these creatures had come out and greet her. Valerie was always interacting with underwater marine life. But today, they pretty much train you in your dive course that you're not allowed to touch anything because you might disturb it. Valerie and Ron never operated like that. The sea snake is reputed to be 20 times more venomous than the cobra. And um, by the end of the 60s, they were gaining quite a reputation for being underwater filmmakers. We started to make ourselves our first big money. We could live on our photography. They moved between working on their own documentaries and then going off and working on other people's projects. I wonder what she's up to, Skip. 
You wouldn't catch me swimming here. Dad calls it shark's paradise. We worked in the late 60s on several television shows filming underwater. And probably one we worked on the most was Skippy. Skippy, the bush kangaroo. Skippy was massive back in the day. It was about a kid and his kangaroo, and there would always be someone that got into trouble. I was good at writing scenarios, and I was even better at writing underwater into them. And I even wrote myself into a couple. You're Mr Hammond's boy? Yep. And that's Skippy. Hello, Skip. If you're really interested, you can come out with me. I could do with an assistant. You mean it? Why not? Hop in. Valerie embarks on a little mission with Sonny, but then one thing leads to another. Hurry, Skip! Hurry! Skippy swims for help and saves the day, as usual. I did a bit of stunt work. It was dangled from a helicopter for a long time. I was eventually dropped. It was really entertaining. But there was one particular story that Ron and Valerie worked on that had a really profound effect on them and their, their f future filmmaking. And it had grey nose sharks in it. And we knew we could get them at Seal Rocks. We went up there and to our horror, when we went out to the shark gutter, there were all these dead sharks. Someone had gone down there with a power head and killed everyone. It was very distressing. When I saw all those poor dead grey nurse drifting across the sand in the gutter, I decided I would never kill another shark. I realised that it was a terrible thing. That was their domain, that's where they belonged. We didn't belong there. We should just learn to live with them or leave them alone. I can remember the first sharks I ever killed. I felt pretty good about it, but I've got over that. I feel sorry when I see them dying. Ron and Valerie started to observe sharks at close quarters and understand that you know, this was a, an amazing animal. And they had that epiphany of, of looking closer at the animals and, and understanding that these were you know, incredible evolutionary products dislike them. Mm. Oh, no, I think sharks are one of the most beautiful creatures you can find in the ocean. And that's when they started the love affair, not only with the underwater world, but specifically with sharks. In 1969, Ron and myself were involved with four Americans in a film called Blue Water, White Death. We're looking for the animal that I think is considered to be the most dangerous predators still living in the world. The great white shark. It was a really big project involving some of the world's top divers and filmmakers. They all shared a deep fascination with sharks, um, especially the great white shark. Well, you're going to use the far cylinder first. You turn this one off and turn this one on as well. Yeah. But the first sharks they came across were the equally dangerous oceanic white tips. There's a shark white tip right under the bow. There's another one. There's another one. There are four down here now. Oceanic white tipped sharks are the most dangerous sharks in the world. The death throw vibrations of the whales attract sharks from miles away. Ron and Valerie and the others on the expedition were diving just below a dead whale carcass, uh, which had blood and stuff all around them. And it was, it was terrifying footage, you know. No one had done anything like it before. That was the greatest adventure of our lives. The whole idea is to get out of your cage and make yourself a place in the pack. Peter Gimble, he was the director, turned to me and he said, Valerie, there's no shame in not coming. I said, oh, I'm coming. There must have been well over 100 sharks, probably over 200. The water's deep, very, very deep. It's in the middle of the ocean. There was no way out if they decided to attack. No way. Ron, of course, had a fairly sizable camera unit that I guess he could use to hit sharks or push them away. Valerie had a just a stick 
fending the sharks off and protecting the, the guys in the water filming. The oceanic white tip has one thing it does before it bites, it bumps you. And Peter Gimble decided when they bumped you, bump them back harder, which we did. We had made ourselves a place in the pack and they didn't bother us anymore. I think blue water, white death had a huge impact on people around the world, um, especially as a diver. It taught me to just go for it, basically. Just get in there and go for it. It was very important for Ron and I to prove that sharks were not the enemy. This is William Shatner inviting you to come with us as Ron and Val Taylor unfold the truly unusual story of the vanishing grey nurse. Ron and I made a television series. We called it Inner Space. That series was a turning point. One of the episodes was the first film we ever made with a strong conservation story. Shark and man, eyeball to eyeball. They are not aggressive, but neither are they afraid. Ron and Valerie set out to show the world that the grey nurse shark isn't the predator or the monster that everyone made it out to be. They look nasty, but we learned that they weren't just through experience. They've got long teeth. They're not flesh-biting teeth. They're fish-catching teeth. They couldn't bite a lump out of you, no matter how hard they tried. Back in the 1960s and 1970s, the grey nurse shark, which was prolific along the East Coast, was being hunted to almost the point of extinction. The puppies of the ocean, as Val calls them. They gather during the day in gutters and just sit around quietly, minding their own business. They visit another of the grey nurse's favourite retreats, Montague Island. We knew all the hot spots off the Queensland coast and the New South Wales coast. We went to these places and hardly found a shark. And that was a bit of a shock, because they used to be everywhere. And that's when I went to work to have the grey nurse made a protected shark. Ron and Valerie were definitely pioneers in advocating protection of sharks. They realised that these species were in danger and they really stepped up and did something about it. But the next film they worked on threatened to undermine all the good work they were doing. My late husband, Peter Benchley, was a novelist and um, he was fascinated with sharks, loved the ocean. He wrote a novel about a great white shark that terrorizes a town. And uh, when he told me this idea about the shark, I said, honey, you know, I, d I don't think that that's really going to be a go. The novel was called Jaws. Richard Zanuck and David Brown, the film producers, sent us the galley proofs of this book. It hadn't been published and said, do you think this would make a good feature film, this story? And of course we did. We could see work for the tailors. The director of the film was a very young man called Steven Spielberg. Start the fire extinguishers. You go over, grab the equipment, and I'll cut. He wasn't well known. This was his second major film. I asked Steven what kind of film he was making. Well, it's like a shark film, a shark movie. Is it a horror shark movie? Is it going to scare people? To, uh, what, what will it do? Well, it, it will, I think, initially scare people. It will ca cause a great increase in, uh, in, I think, aquaphobia. Everybody knew about Ron and Val, so they were brought on to do the second unit photography of sharks underwater. Um, off of South Australia. They wanted to get the underwater live shark footage before they went into production. It was quite a surprise that Stephen actually wanted to have the mechanical shark in the movie 30 feet. I said, uh, Stephen, there's a problem here. Our uh, white sharks are only about 13 feet long. And he said, no problem. We'll uh, send out a half-size man and half-size cages. And that's exactly what happened. The studio hired Carl Rizzo, a very good stuntman. 
to go down to South Australia to a swim in a cage with the great white sharks so they could get this footage. And off we went with our buckets of blood and meat and our director and our stuntman and our half-sized cages. We got out there and made the horrible discovery. The stuntman wasn't a diver. The first shark that came up to the boat, he looked at it and he said, I want to speak to my manager now. And we knew then we were going to have a problem. When Carl saw those great white sharks swimming around, he was terrified. On one occasion, I was about uh, 10 metres down, filming up, and the shark was swimming around the small boat. The cage was in the water, and the, there's a shark there, and I'm thinking, why isn't Carl getting in the cage? And then, then suddenly, the uh, shark went over the top of the cage, the, the steel bridle, and started thrashing around. The winch and everything broke off and came tumbling down past me and Carl wasn't in the cage, and that's what saved his life. They found Carl 20 minutes later, and he was in the forecastle, curled up with the lines from the boat uh, with a bottle of gin in his hands, and he never went back in the water again. The footage that Ron shot the day the shark got tangled in the winch was one of the highlights of the film when they were being attacked by the mechanical shark. They used it, it wasn't in the script, but they rewrote that section. And it's interesting that people are so taken in to the imaginary world of the movie that they didn't honestly notice the difference between the movements of the mechanical shark and, and the real shark. They just blended them together. We were taken by Universal to Martha's Vineyard when they were shooting with the actors. So we got to meet everybody. It was very nice. We met Steven Spielberg. He looked incredibly young. Roy Scheider became our friend. He wanted to know everything about the underwater world. When Jaws came out, we thought it'd be just a second-rate film might do well. We had no idea. Jaws was the biggest grossing film of that era. And it was really the first big blockbuster summer movie. But we never expected the reaction of the general public to Sharks in the Wild. You saw Jaws then? Yes. Is it the only thing that's really influenced you against sharks, though, and against surfing? It's the main thing, yes. And um, it just scares one to go in a little bit. It was a bit of a shock. People became terrified of going to the beach. Some people actually uh, went out and just tried to shoot sharks. Uh, Peter and I were just devastated and so so upset that that was the, some of the reaction to the movie. People who saw the movie Jaw Jaws are afraid of sharks. Have we reason to be afraid of them? Universal sent Ron and I all over America. We did every single talk show. And the idea was to tell people that this was a fictitious story about a fictitious shark. Uh, we have been criticised for uh, promoting sharks as being man-eaters and dangerous, but Jaws is actually a fictional film. If you go into the water, there's always a very slight risk. Over the years, there's been a change in the audience reaction to the book and movie. Nowadays, people understand that sharks are important, but when the film first came out, uh, it made it really tough for Ron and Val, who had already been working on shark issues and shark conservation. After Ron and I came back from touring America, I 
desperately wanted to protect sharks. The shark that I was most concerned about was the grey nurse. It was being killed all along the east coast of Australia. I realised if they weren't protected, they would disappear. I started writing letters to fisheries in 1977. And I state very clearly, the shark is most definitely not an attacker of man. And they were being slaughtered for sport and they should be protected. But these things don't happen quickly. Valerie spent endless hours writing and writing letters, putting herself out there, uh, photographing grey nose sharks. It just went on and on for years. In 1984, finally, we had the killing of grey nurse made illegal along the New South Wales coast. The ban meant if you hooked one, you had to release it, and you couldn't go out and shoot them or kill them for fun. In fact, it was the first species of shark in the world to be protected. That's a big win. I mean, it's a big win whenever you have a conservation win with anything. But we know that the grey nurse was pursued for its fins and for its meat. So there was a section of the community, the fisher community, who didn't like that. I eventually got a couple of death threats. I was verbally attacked by a man in Queensland who said, I just wanted people's blood to stain the oceans red. But man is a danger to man. Motor cars are a danger to man. Your pet dog up the street is a danger. She, she kept going and in the process upset people that didn't agree with her views. Conservation, there is no such thing on killer sharks because the general Australian public realises they're killer sharks and that's all there is to it. And it wasn't just sharks that she was trying to have protected. It was a whole range of marine life and areas. And now a shot for the front page. A giant Queensland grouper considered by some to be more dangerous than a shark. Ron and Valerie found a really special place up in North Queensland off Lizard Island, which they called the Cod Hole because there were so many of these big potato cod up there. The potato cod is basically a groper, massive, massive fish. The bigger ones would be probably 200 odd kilo. The big groper come over, push their big faces into yours. It's wonderful. They'll come up very close. They're not afraid of humans. You know, and so they were easy spearfishing targets. So she worked very hard to have that cod hole put away as a conservation site. And Ron and Valerie have done that in many different areas. The Australian sea lion has been the focus of a lot of Valerie's campaigning over the years. This is one of the animals that Valerie loves deeply and fears for the most. You think I was trying to get a killer dragon protected? Trying to convince the powers that be that sea lions are a gift from God. My favourite marine animal of all. They're like puppy dogs. They should be totally protected. Not just by word, but by action. And so they were. But they are still disappearing. We'll lose them all within 20 years if we don't stop killing them. There's so much conservation work that she's done that people don't even realise she's done. She wants to get everything protected. But campaigning for sharks is quite difficult because after any major attack, fear levels in the community rise. Come on, shark! In the early 80s, we were working on a series called Amazing Animals. We were shooting off the coast of San Diego. There's an area out there where deep water sharks come up sometimes in large numbers. They're blue sharks. You only get them in the open ocean. I was sitting down having breakfast when another underwater cinema photographer rushed in and said, sharks off the back deck. I just left my toast, ran out, suited up. Did you give me a hand with the pod, Ron? Mm. Okay, tuck it inside. Mm -hmm. And get my hair in too. And we all jumped in. And I'm looking around and there are sharks everywhere. Once again, they were swimming with potentially dangerous sharks and that made for some pretty dramatic viewing. 
So I'm spinning around, waiting for the cameraman to get themselves together. And I suddenly felt a little bump on my leg. Just a push. Distracted by two sharks near my head, I didn't see this one come. It grabbed my leg. I looked down, my leg was in a shark's mouth, and I thought, oh. So I grabbed its nose so it couldn't move its head, and I hit it in the gills as hard as I could. Swam away, and I looked down thinking, did Ron get that? He was busy looking at his camera. As all cameramen do at the critical moment, they look at the camera. Cloud fights it off. The shark circles and comes back at her. She hits it again. Fortunately, the shark came back. By this time, Ron had noticed I was in a bit of a bother up there. And the shark grabbed my leg again, and I punched it off. That footage was the big piece of action. A lot of newsworthy publicity, I guess. Ron and the divers moved to get Val to the surface and out of the water right away. The vision of Valerie getting bitten uh, is absolutely extraordinary. It's extremely rare to get footage of somebody actually being bitten on camera, and it would have been very confronting for the viewer. Ron swam over, but by then I'd surfaced and I called out to the above water crew, get the cameras rolling, get the sound on. I've been bitten, I think it's bad. I think it's probably a sign that Valerie's a true filmmaker. She's just been bitten by a shark and she's actually giving direction to the crew on how to shoot the sequence. Oh, that one's cut right into your wetsuit, Valerie. I tell you, it's cut right through my legs. How bad is it? Uh, yeah, it's oh, horrible. Oh, yeah, it's a bad cut. When I saw the footage of Valerie after her bite, Valerie seemed to be just annoyed with herself that she'd let herself get in the situation of being bitten. I feel darn stupid. Oh, oh. I feel that's... like a frank amateur. Oh, that's a bloody mess in there. I know. Well, that's it. Sorry, guys. <laughs> well, that's the luck of the business. Mm -hmm. We've been at it over 20 years now, and this is the first... Uh, yep, that's the first shark bite. First bite. And she'll tell you, if you're ever going to be bitten by a shark, do it in Hollywood, where they'll pay for the best surgeons. They flew me into hospital, three layers of stitches. It didn't change the way I worked or felt about sharks at all. I possibly decided I shouldn't get in the water when there's more sharks than we can handle. But uh, other than that, went back, finished the job. Everybody was happy. I'm Valerie Taylor, and I've been trying to get sharks to bite me because I'm wearing a special protective suit. I'm Ron Taylor. You won't see much of me because I'll be close to Valerie doing most of the camera work. It wasn't that long after Valerie was bitten that she was back in the water conducting one of their most famous experiments. We had tried many different methods of shark repeller, but Ron always felt that butcher's boning gloves made out of a steel mesh would work if we had a whole suit of it. Encased in all that steel, I feel almost indestructible. But the amazing thing is it was very difficult to get the sharks to bite. They, they just simply don't want to bite you. She put tuna fish in the arms of this chainmail suit to attract the sharks. Alexander helps me become what I think would be the shark's idea of dinner. The sharks didn't like the metallic taste, so they were, they were avoiding her, but the smell of the tuna fish attracted them. And the sharks couldn't resist it. I learned a lot about sharks biting in many different ways. The mesh suit experiment was front page on the National Geographic. I felt really great about having this one because I knew it would get the story across to the whole world. You know, it's one of the few times Australia was featured back then on the front cover, and here were Ron and Val sort of breaking new ground. But some scientists were sceptical, of course, and it was perceived as a stunt by some people in, in the sector. I wasn't trying to make a scientific fact. I didn't want to be written up in the books. We were just... Filmmakers. It was a good film. When you do things like wear a chainmail suit underwater to interact with a shark, there are always going to be your critics. 
but I think there was always a serious purpose to her work and to Ron's work. Valerie is the world-class underwater photographer, not just a lady in a pink suit pushing sharks. She had a massive collection of uh, photographs and, and that was her work. Valerie was being recognised with awards and citations and dinners all over the world. But sometimes the last place you recognise is in your own backyard. The first Australian achiever for the year 2002 is Valerie Taylor. It took a long time for Australians to wake up and realise that she was really achieving great things in marine conservation. When I heard about it, I just wanted to run out in the street and scream, I'm an Australian achiever. <laughs> I really did because I have received so many awards in other countries around the world and I have never been publicly recognised as achieving anything in my own country. Most of you would know me as the shark lady, the woman in the mesh suit who gets bitten by sharks, but not many of you know me as the constant letter writer to governments. <laughs> Sorry. Bleating on and on about conservation. Ron and Valerie into their 60s and even 70s, so they were still working hard together. Do you think we're on top of the problem of, of depleting the marine species and looking after the marine environment generally? Not at all. No, we haven't even started to look after it. There was never a turn-off period. Let's make a marine reserve. Let's stop shark fishing in the Coral Sea. Uh, let's prevent any shark finning. Can somebody give me a, a pumpkin? Here? Unfortunately, eventually they had to start slowing down. About 15 years ago, we'd been on a trip to the Great Barrier Reef and all of us had got colds, but Ron's cold hadn't really got any better. Um, when he came home, he went to the doctors, which was very unlike him. He hated going to doctors. And we were just sitting down for dinner and his doctor rang and said, Mrs. Taylor, I have some bad news. Your husband has acute myeloid leukemia taking him to the hospital now. I fell apart. Yeah, that was a big blow for her. He was her soulmate, you know, her whole sort of existence. And that turned everything on its head um, because he needed, uh, you know, quite significant treatment. Other people have, have had miracles where the can cancer disappears and I'm hoping that that's what's going to happen to me. And I'll be very happy if I can uh, get rid of my cancer. And I'll be happy too. <laughs> when we found out Ron was sick, we had already made plans to go to Fiji, to the bull sharks, and we did that. I went out every day. He only made it for two days. And that's when we both realised it was the finish. I never expected Ron to die before me. I was going to go first. He was so strong mentally and physically. He never got sick. I was the one who got sick. And I miss him. I miss him terribly. It was extremely hard for Valerie uh, when Ron passed away, also because they didn't have kids, so they just had each other. And they pretty much did everything together. And that's a massive void when you take half of that equation away. And so it was like part of her was missing. But because Valerie had a passion, she could continue with her purpose. That's what's kept her going. I've never actually dived fish rock, but you'd be pleased to know I've got plans to do so in January, I think. You'll yeah. love it. It's really, really good. She's 87 now, and she's still out there trying to protect the grey nose shark. The sharks are excellent. They're used to people. Even though Ron and Valerie had gotten some protection for the grey nurse in 1984, at best, we've slowed the decline, and now they're estimated to be about 2,200 adults on the East Coast. So they are still critically endangered. Unfortunately, 
The area used to be protected from fishing, but they've allowed the fishermen to come back in, mm. and a lot of the sharks have got hooks and lines out of their mouth. The aggregation sites where grey nurse sharks hang out, they're also popular for recreational fishers. They might not necessarily be aware of the impacts they're having on grey nurse sharks. The taking of the grey nurse is against the law, but they can't stop them taking a fish hook. And when the, they swallow the hook, it calcifies inside their stomach and they die. On this map here with Great Sandy, we want to see the grey nurse aggregation sites across the east coast made into the marine sanctuaries. So not having any form of fishing in these areas at all. Hello, Valerie. Oh, hello. What a pleasure to see you. So Valerie recently met with the Federal Environment Minister Tanya Plibersek mm -hmm. to discuss the issue of... Um, how are you going? I'm still going, that's the main thing. One of the main legacies I feel she wants to leave behind is to, as she calls it, create that string of pearls on the East Coast. I would like to see all the main grey nurse gutters along the coast totally protected. Yeah. Really? So we've got a new Threatened Species Action Plan towards zero extinctions and the grey nurse shark is one of the priority species in that plan. Um, we're doing a review of the marine protected areas. So mm -hmm. again, that's something that we would love your input on. What we want to make sure is that in 2023 that we really do take this commitment and, and make it work. <laughs> So it's made of metal and a suit. The Australian Museum is currently staging the shark's exhibition. This is a shark that's been biting her arm, but it's so that she can study it and it won't hurt her. It's been our biggest exhibition that we've ever created. Of course, we asked Val Taylor to open the exhibition. Who better to do it? If a great white shark doesn't scare you, what scares Valerie Taylor? Hot. Hi. <laughs> I feel that the general public are starting to realise that the ocean is an important part of the well-being of the planet and therefore of themselves. But there's a lot to be done and I'm not going to live long enough to do much more. How can we help you personally amplify your message of conservation? Well, I'm just stunned, stunned. I've never been offered help before. <laughs> I think young people are inspired by Valerie Taylor, so it's driving this new wave of interest. I keep telling her, we're preparing your 100th birthday celebration, Valerie. Uh, you're going to be there. There's no way she's going to stop the conservation effort. She'll go into the box still saying, we've got to conserve that. My son Luke is 14. He, Valerie and I went on a trip to Indonesia last year. And it was so special to see him and Valerie diving together um, and for him to learn about the, the marine life and for her, for Valerie still to be trying to coax eels out of their holes. Um, that's amazing. If more kids could could have those opportunities, um, there'd probably be a lot more conservationists around. I'm going to Indonesia again in five days to go on a dive trip to Raja Ampat. And I've just come down here to make sure my fins still hang together and my face mask doesn't leak. It's going to be a bit cold, but I'll manage and uh, I might see something worthwhile looking at, you never know. I've had the best life anybody could ever have. It's all an adventure. Being born is an adventure. Life is an adventure. All you have to do is live it, accept it, Run with it.